Somewhere on Earth invites you to the far north, to the kingdom of Norway, an immense territory that extends well beyond the Arctic Circle. Norway has 80,000 kilometers of coast. It's the most irregular coastline in the world and the longest in Europe. Thierry Isungset is not your ordinary artist. This composer draws his inspiration from the elements of nature. He's blazing new trails in music and doing the impossible. He makes ice music. Alexander Lingberg is an extreme adventurer, and Lapland is an ideal terrain for him to live out his passions. He makes his living from the sea, and the wind carries his dreams. Now he's getting ready to tackle the world's toughest snow kite competition. Heidi Sevestre is a glaciologist. This young French woman lives year-round in the Svalbard Islands, just a few hundred kilometers from the North Pole. Here in these northern lands, she has found an untamed expanse that can satisfy her thirst for freedom. As soon as you set foot here, you feel right at home. And it's really a little bubble of peace and quiet. The longer you stay here in Svalbard, the harder it is to leave. The Arctic acts like a magnet for those in quest of the absolute. The Dutch explorer, Willem Barents, discovered Spitsbergen in 1596 while leading an expedition to find a northwest passage to Asia. Blocked by ice, his crew had to spend the winter here and even dismantled a part of the ship in order to survive. Barents himself did not survive. This sea north of Norway now bears his name. It was not until 1838 that the first full-fledged scientific expedition took place. La Recherche, a French corvette, sailed from the port of Le Havre in France up the coast of Norway, then headed for Spitsbergen. The expedition would last for two years, during which 80 crew members and 17 scientists eager for new discoveries bravely explored these northern regions. Up until then, the rare visitors to Spitsbergen were mainly whalers and trappers. Those days are long gone, but this is still a land of adventure. Heidi is 26. She has been living on Spitsbergen in the Svalbard Islands for five years. This here is quite a rifle. It's a Mauser from the Second World War. It really stands up well to the cold. More recent lighter rifles tend to seize up when the cold sets in, but there's no problem with this one. At five kilos, it's heavy, but you can count on it. I have to do target practice because there's a danger of polar bears. They're all over the Svalbard Islands. Well, there's room for improvement. The polar bear is the largest predator in the islands and is not at all afraid of man. It'll come right up to a group of people without any fear at all. You have to be prepared for unexpected reactions from a polar bear. Some are curious and a little wary, but a large male could charge us just like that.
The Svalbard Islands are situated 840 kilometers north of Norway and 1,300 kilometers from the North Pole. In these inhospitable lands, where the polar night lasts six months and temperatures can drop to minus 50, scientists from all over the world have found a winter wonderland for their research. Longyearbyen, Spitsbergen's one and only town, is the world's northernmost community. It was founded by the early coal miners who braved the Arctic in hope of a better life. Heidi is a teacher and researcher at UNIS, the University of Svalbard. Here in the Svalbards, you just grab a map and say, where should we go tomorrow? We're right out in the field. No excuse not to go. You just walk 200 meters and you're in the great outdoors. In her field of research, glaciology, Heidi needs to master the dangers of ice and crevices. She and her students regularly practice the gestures that would save a life if one of them were to fall while out doing field work. I was attracted to these islands because they have so much to offer. The mountains, the cold, nature right in your face. It makes you feel small compared to nature. I grew up in the French Alps, so I spent my childhood in the mountains, hopping from one peak to another. It's the same here. But here, nature rules your everyday life. Heidi has found her place and her equilibrium on these unbounded expanses here at the ends of the earth, where every day is a challenge. For me, there's no distinction between my work and my passion. My work is my passion. It's my life. When I realized that I could make glaciology my profession, I went for it. Okay, perfect. In Spitsbergen, the slightest hitch can have enormous consequences, so you have to be prepared for anything. That's why we have so much equipment. We need it to protect ourselves from the polar bears and from avalanches and for rescues. We also need it to determine our position. So a GPS, a satellite phone, and an emergency beacon, which is a simple button you push if you're in trouble that sends a signal to the authorities so they can come and rescue us. It's a lot of gear, but it's all necessary when you're taking students out into the field. Okay, awesome. Okay, guys, so... The plan for today is to do a bit of radar. So we're going to try to do GPR, it is called. It means ground penetrating radar. The scooter will pull the radar. And it looks like a very long antenna, which is a the Svalbards are an ideal laboratory for glaciology. We will drive maximum for two-thirds of its surface is covered with glaciers. So it's very important to the university courses are given right on site. Speed constant. And we'll be able to measure how thick the glacier is. And also it will tell us what is the temperature of the ice. So it will be related to how fast a glacier can move to know the temperature of the ice. So it always On étudie la we study glaciers because they help us understand the climate. The Arctic is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. 
Glaciology not only gives us information about what's happened in the past, it also helps us predict the future. Make sure it doesn't fall too hard on the, on the bag yet. Analyzing the glacier's movements is a way to forecast a much more widespread phenomenon, the rising level of the seas on a global scale. We're off in our own world, our own bubble. Some people think we're doing this because we enjoy it, because we're scientists and we love doing this. But our work has a much larger dimension. Our data will be useful to many populations living on the world's seacoasts. It's a strong motivation. This is our common dog pool. There are three owners. Two of the dogs are Alex's, and the rest belong to two of my friends. Let's take these guys out for a run. We're just riding on the sled, but these dogs have a sixth sense that keeps us safe. There could be a polar bear or another danger, the ice pack that's too thin or cracked, a glacier that has crevices, for example. The dogs, that could sense all that. Landscapes replaces pictures from the best to new growing. This magical union everywhere. The pioneering spirit still lingers in the Svalbards. A whiff of adventure still haunts the ice. It really gives me a thrill to go right there where no one else goes. I think that fear is basically a fear of the unknown. But for me, it's a great motivation. Back then, I would have been the first to hop on a ship headed for the Svalbards, for sure. The warm Gulf Stream keeps the entire Norwegian coastline free of ice. 
the fishermen can take to sea all year round, even during the Arctic winter. Alexander Lingberg is a child of the far north. This former naval officer, who has sailed all the oceans of the globe, has come back to live in his native land, Finnmark. He's a fisherman in the Barents Sea. He specialized in giant red king crabs. I've been uh, here for one week now. So now we're going to check them and see uh, what it is. There is some catch. Yeah, once we get a really big one, uh, it was over eight kilos, one crab. It's exciting, you know. What do we catch today? Nothing. There's not so much food in them, but we'll check out the next one and see if there is some catch. After education, I started working in ships. I went to the US, worked there for a year in Africa and the North Sea, and it um, gets a bit boring. So I went back to the start and started fishing again, being this uh, beautiful environment. Another catch. It came originally from Alaska, and in the 60s, the, the Russian put this out here for, uh, for food for the soldiers. <laughs> so it has been uh, coming to Norway, and it's going further west every year. It's a nice one. This is about uh, three kilos, and it can get about up to 10. Uh, when they lose one leg, uh, they, they will grow up a new one. So it's, <laughs> it's a weird, weird uh, <laughs> animal. The Russians tried several times to introduce crabs to the Arctic Ocean. They failed each time. So they created a new breed a cross between two very resistant species. Now, the giant red king crab is the largest in the world. It can live 30 years and measure up to 1 meter 50, tip to tip. The seafaring tradition in Norway dates back to the time of the Vikings, 1,200 years ago. Those great navigators were among the first to construct boats sturdy enough to venture away from the coasts and sail the open seas. In the extreme north of Europe, beyond the Arctic Circle, lies a vast territory, Lapland. It spreads across parts of Norway, Sweden, Finland, and Russia. This is the land of the Sami, nomadic herders, they were the first to set foot on these endless expanses. That was 10,000 years ago. When Alexander is not out at sea, he spends his time snow kiting. More than a sport, it's an ideal way to cross Lapland's vast frozen stretches. What I like about living in this environment is the freedom and uh, being together in the nature, the elements around you, and be a part of it. Yeah, that's what I'm living for, a living of the nature. I'm uh, fishing for living and kiting for fun. Snow kiting gives one incredible freedom of movement. You can slide across the plateaus at 80 kilometers an hour, cross frozen seas, climb the slopes. 
Equipped with a sledge hooked onto his waist, the kiter is totally self-sufficient and can travel for long periods of time, covering hundreds of kilometers. Skiing has existed for more than 4,000 years in the north of Europe. It mainly allowed the Arctic populations to break out of their isolation, to hunt, to tend their herds, and even to go to war. Later, skiing was a key factor in the conquest of the Poles. I love being alone in this big area, this big playground. Yeah, it's a pleasure. You don't think about any worries in the world. It's only you and uh, the kite. Mine get reset. This is the best place on earth for uh, those who like to be outside in the wildness. Especially if you like snow kiting. There is nowhere on earth you can do this, like here. Alexander is in training for the VACO race, the toughest snow kite competition in the world, which will take place here in a few days. He and Alf Ole are teammates. They've been training and preparing for six months, for the race is a veritable expedition, 300 kilometers through a hostile environment. We have to get to the high plateau and travel along up there until we get to this valley. The highest point of the valley is right here, and the checkpoint's here. At Vadso. That's the finish line. Yeah. You might get lost uh, if the GPS is not working. Um, well, you've got the wind direction. It's always a good, good thing, you know. Uh, you know the direction, you know then where to go. Uh, you know when you are from this area, you're used to it and you don't see the, the same way as other people. <laughs> the big question mark of the race is the weather. A snowstorm doesn't necessarily mean a good wind. And if there's no wind, the sail can't pull the skier and his sledge. There have been times when not a single team finished the race on account of the lack of wind. So they have to be prepared to continue on foot as far as possible. To take part in the race, it's not enough to know how to handle the sail. You need a lot of experience with long expeditions and bivouacs in extreme conditions. For when night falls, the temperature can plunge to minus 30. During the long Arctic night, the sky offers a dazzling show. The Sami used to believe that the northern lights were caused by the passage of the cosmic fire fox. As he ran across the snow-covered landscape, his tail would graze the snow and throw up sparks. The Sami beliefs have gradually disappeared, but certain traditions remain. There are an estimated 70,000 Sami living in Lapland. Uh, 
Alexander is paying a visit to two old friends, Sveinum and Lars. They're reindeer herders. Usually, I don't see anyone out here. But once in a while, some people do pass by. We've set the tent up just because we have a herd of reindeer nearby. This is our base camp. In this area, I would say most of the people have salmon blood. When you come uh, closer to the coast, it's, it's more uh, mixed with Norwegian and uh, they do have salmon blood. Uh, uh, but we come from a more um, uh, traditional fishing. Uh, the most uh, traditional thing is to do reindeer, but uh, there are some who come more from the coast who are into fishing. So that's where I come from. But in old times, it was a bit tricky. For a long time, the Sami were victims of discrimination. They weren't allowed to speak their own language or practice their rituals. They weren't allowed to sing the yoik, which was the main means of transmitting their knowledge and lore. Lars is a guardian of the traditions. He knows the secrets of the yoik. I'm going to do a yoik about a wolf. The wolf wanders all over the tundra. He's hungry. He's looking for something to eat. All of a sudden, he hears a reindeer. And then he attacks. That's the end of the story. He catches the reindeer, and that's the end of the yoik. <laughs> Those hard times are now past for the Sami. Lapland is now officially recognized by the four countries it spans. This territory corresponds, in fact, to the range of the reindeer's migrations. The reindeer spend the winter high on the plateaus, where the ground snow swept by the wind is thinner. The reindeer are not penned up, they're semi-wild. It's been a difficult season for the herders. Alexander has come to lend a hand. We need to feed them uh, this winter due to uh, the warm winter. Uh, and the warm winter made it icy on the snow, so the reindeer don't get through the snow. So we need to give them some extra food. It's, it's important to, for them to survive this winter and also to when they give birth. The successive periods of mild weather followed by cold snaps cause layers of thick ice to build up on the ground. The reindeer can't break through to reach the lichen they usually feed on. They're scattering the hay over the high plateau to disperse the reindeer and avoid conflicts. There are a few hundred reindeer in this herd. As soon as the spring comes, Lars and Svenung will take down their yurt and follow the reindeer to the rich green pastures on the coastlands, 80 kilometers away.
I really enjoy this work. I could have done a number of other things, but I wouldn't have lasted very long. Here I keep at it. Even if I'm tired, it doesn't matter. Alexander is used to the mountain. He sees right away what needs to be done. He's used to working outdoors in bad weather. He adapts very quickly to the work in the mountain. Well, the conditions are just about the same as at the sea, you know. <laughs> it's even worse at sea, because out at sea you can't make the slightest error. No, you can't. Alexander is doing the final preparations for the race. Given the extreme conditions, forgetting the slightest thing could have disastrous consequences. The rules stipulate that each team be equipped to survive on their own for five days. On the Varanger Peninsula, in the northernmost part of the country, the plateau rises abruptly to 600 meters above sea level. The tundra remains blanketed in snow until the month of May. The world's top kiters are gathering in this protected zone. The selection procedure for the race is very tough. This is the first time that Alexander and Alf Ole have qualified. I feel a little bit stressed and excited, very excited. I can feel it in my stomach. A lot of good uh, characters around here, so we want to try to be, uh, get a good start here. I'm nervous. It's going to be tough, I think. A lot of kites in the air and uh, a lot of lines. 80 kites with 25-meter uh, lines, that's a lot of lines around. The adventure is the goal. We don't give up. We just go. That's not an option. I think it's going to be OK. We are going <laughs> to make it good. teams, off and running into the unknown, swept along by the wind of adventure and the desire to break free. Only 24 will make it to the finish line after several days of battling the cold and fatigue, which costs them a staggering effort. Alexander may feel perfectly at home on this vast territory and know it like the back of his hand, he doesn't manage to make it to the finish line. He does, however, achieve his goal, which was to surpass himself, confront the elements, and become one with nature. Yeah, this is a good place to go exploring, because you can live here a lifetime and have a new place every day. Yeah, which you haven't been before. It's so huge, it's, uh, you can't go everywhere. Then you have to have a real long life. Norway means the way to the north. 
In winter, the Arctic temperatures pose a real challenge to life. The cold is so extreme, it obliterates the horizon. But it doesn't phase the stalwart souls here. For some, it's even a source of inspiration. Thierry Isungset is one of those for whom nature is both muse and work of poetry. Musically, I find nature very, very inspiring. Like when we came to this place, the first thing I hear is the beautiful sound of this river. The mixture of uh, half frozen river, you know, of ice and not ice, the sound is amazing. When I work on compositions, I might include sounds from water, from birds, uh, from fishes, whales. <laughs> uh, for me as a musician, it's very important to express something. It will not be a concrete expression that people might understand, but it's for sure, for me, it's very important. We're almost there, guys. Will we be able to climb onto the glacier? Yes, but we won't need to climb on top to get inside the glacier. Okay, let's get a look at this ice. Terrier and his team have come to the Jostel d'Asbrin glacier in the south of Norway. Here, on one of the 50 arms of Europe's largest glacier, he's planning to carry out an imaginative new project, creating and recording his music right inside a glacier. This is a dream. Can you take a chunk? Do you have room in your backpack? Mm -hmm. Nice sound, huh? I think it's... Uh... Amazing to see this uh, glacier ice. It's fantastic. The color is beautiful. If it has sound or not, I cannot tell you yet. I need to, we need to make pieces and check them. But it looks like it's a little bit too much uh, air and uh, not so compact, kind of. But if we manage to find a cave or something underneath the glacier, it probably will be uh, better ice. It's the uh, first time ever I'm uh, in an ice cave. <laughs> and first of all, I think it's incredibly beautiful. 
the light is very unique. I've never seen a blue color like this before. And uh, also there are some instruments here, ready-made, <laughs> kind of. It's amazing, isn't it? Terrier came up with the idea of using ice in his musical creations in 1999, when he was composing for a concert at the foot of a frozen waterfall. Ever since, he's been working tirelessly to perfect his art. His instruments, all made of ice, are inventions that spring straight from his imagination, like the isophone. Bernard Svidal is Terrier's assistant. His help is precious because before each performance, the instruments have to be made from scratch. It's beautiful. It's a piece of art <laughs> made by nature. That's good. But this one should be a little higher. Like this. Each setup for a concert or a recording session is a long, delicate process. I want to tune it. And then I take off. Here we have more sound, so we leave it as it is. What happened was that uh, when I heard the sound and saw the beauty of ice, I kind of fell in love with it immediately and, and just had to continue the work simply. It's not like if you have a Stradivarius violin, you know, you know exactly how it sounds. With the eyes, when I make a new instrument, I don't even know what sound it is. So, and let the instrument or the sound show me where to go musically. Terrier is from Jelo, a village in the center of Norway. He spends most of his time on tour. He gives 150 concerts a year all over the world. He travels everywhere with his ice, by car and even by plane. For me, uh, uh, life has been simple in the way that I think I always knew I would deal with music. I couldn't see any choice or any other options. So I started to play on garbage around five, six years old. Uh, but uh, when I was eight, I got my first drum kit. But I have no musical education except for performing and kind of searching myself. During the winter, Bernard has the job of harvesting enough ice for a year's worth of performances. The ice is fragile. It's a very difficult operation. He has to work barehanded on a frozen lake 
at a temperature of minus 15. The quality of the ice will uh, make a good quality ice music instrument. You can uh, use artificial ice for sculptures and structures, but uh, not, uh, you cannot uh, make the artificial ice and make instruments out of it. No tunes will come out of it. That's maybe 90% of the work, <laughs> to find the good ice. I was in Russia. We had 100 pieces of ice from the same lake, and only seven of them had sound. The best sounding ice I've ever had in my life is the ice from 2003, from north of Sweden. I say it's like good wine, you know, this is a really good year. You can go to the same lake that had the best ice in 2003, and this year maybe no sound. The more complex instruments are produced in Terrier's workshop. The material is as fragile as it is precious. Each performance is unique as are these ephemeral instruments. is a trailblazer. With the heart of the glaciers, he composes a new horizon. His creations give voice to the wondrous, enchanting sounds of the realm of ice. but uh, I think it's worth every second of it. I think the, most of the music kind of have showed up. Uh, it's not music that I have heard, that I tried to copy. 
uh, or things like this. Uh, so it's feel more like a part of me or I am a part of the music. <laughs>